Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 125. This is Jay Michael, your host. Thank you so much for tuning in today. With 17 years of experience behind the torch, I am as excited as always to bring you conversations with artists, sharing their stories in hopes to inspire and entertain while helping you grow your business. And today is no exception. Today is a best of featuring Jupiter Nielsen. He is a glass artist based out of Hawaii. And if you had not yet heard this episode, this was a classic for the show. Uh, get into a lot of fun conversations about teaching classes, uh, what it costs financially to work in Hawaii, and uh, especially their oxygen, which is absolutely freaking crazy how much it costs. You'll hear in the episode, just mind-blowing. Uh, put some stuff in per- to perspective for you uh, if you're an artist and you understand what oxygen costs. Uh, but I'm currently coming back, t- uh, coming to you from backstage at Epcot here at the Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando, Florida, where I'm holding down the fort here at the Mexican Pavilion at Epcot for the next week and a half or so. Uh, this is my home base where I normally work, but this week uh, my other artist, Susan, is out of town on vacation. So I'm doing a nine-day fun uh, straight marathon basically here, uh, doing like 90 hours in a row. So it's one reason we got a best of... And I want to apologize, too, for last week not putting any episodes out at all. Uh, subconsciously, my brain just kind of shut down and uh, went into a weird funk. Actually, it took probably about two weeks' worth of it. Uh, just things coming up, glass breaking, orders getting behind, compiling and getting overwhelmed. And uh, I just felt the need to just shut down. And so, again, I apologize for not being on time and not putting anything out there. But I uh, hope this uh, comes to you. And a bright sunny day wherever you are, melting glass, and just listening to the show. And if this is your first time tuning in, thank you for tuning in. Uh, normally we don't usually do best ofs, but just for today, uh, this week I'm doing a couple of them. Um, just because, again, I'm going to be here at work and don't have a whole lot of time to get some shows out. Uh, but I do have a bunch of interviews lined up. Uh, I had a bunch actually already lined up, and then we had a hurricane come through. And then Labor Day happened, so I had to reschedule several interviews, uh, which will be getting knocked out next week, uh, including Dustin Revere, and uh, been pretty stoked to talk to him, and he's uh, one of the inspirations that got me started on doing this podcast, so definitely be honored to have him on the show. We've been playing phone tag and getting back and forth, and I think we've both got our schedule lined up to where we can get it going, so look forward to that, as well as our series on how to sell your work and price it. Uh, Part five is coming up on manufacturing, basically the idea of uh, high volume, low end production versus low end, or yeah, see, high end, low volume production versus high volume, low end production. There we go, I spit it out, it took a second. <laughs> so, anyways, before I keep rambling, uh, don't forget, if you have not yet subscribed to the show, go to iTunes, if you have an iPhone, and subscribe to the show, let's go look up Wise Guy Radio. Uh, if you're on a Droid, you can go to uh, the App Store and get your Stitcher app or another different podcast player app and just search for the show there and uh, check us out for sure. Also go to wiseguymedia.com if you have not yet gone to the site. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, definitely go there and send me a little message. Uh, you can contact me at the top right corner of the website. It says contact. And it goes directly to my email and I will respond. And thank you for uh, those who participated in our Secret Santa pendant trade. Uh, it was hugely successful. We had 54 artists sign up and uh, trade and everything else. And I'm going to be posting an Instagram picture here pretty soon and also a page on the website of everybody's pendants that were created and traded out. So it's pretty exciting stuff. And I was able to uh, get all the bugs and kinks worked out to get a system set up. So every quarter, uh, we're going to be doing some kind of trade of some sort, whether it's something functional or something art-wise related, maybe a theme. But uh, that would be something kind of fun as a community. We can all get together and share our work with each other in a kind of a fun, free way. So that's what it's all about. So in the meantime, before I keep rambling, I'm going to get the hell out of here. We'll talk to you soon on episode 126. And in the meantime, enjoy this interview, Best Of, with Jupiter Nielsen. And we'll talk to you soon. Love you. Take care. Bye-bye. 
What's happening, Jupiter? How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good. Aloha. Yeah, man. Aloha. Stoked that uh, you are out in Hawaii, a place that I've always wanted to visit ever since I was a small child, and I will get out there one day. Um, so, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. good spot. Yeah, dude. Slightly, slightly envious. I'm just like five blocks from the water myself, but it's not Hawaii. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> it's, so Yeah, God you bless. know, everybody loves the water, but I'm a mountain person. Like, that's actually what I gravitate towards more, and it's got it all. That's what people kind of... Don't yeah. quite realize about Hawaii. It's got a little bit of everything here. So yeah, yeah, that's it, what I like about it. Yeah, isn't there like is even snow at times in some of the higher elevations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mount Akea means White Mountain. They get, it's fourteen thousand feet up there, so they, yeah. they get every year. I think they actually even had like a couple months ago or something. Jesus. Not that long ago. Crazy. Yeah, not too much over here though. We're only ten thousand on Maui, so I'm on Maui. Okay, nice. Way. Hell yeah, dude. Well, before we get off track here too quickly, let's uh, get, <laughs> at least get uh-huh. started on the right foot here. So if uh, you want to give us a little bit of brief background on yourself, uh, your personal life and whatever if you want to, and then also your glass life, uh, where you got started, how you got started, and uh, where you're at now. Uh, yeah, I'm from a little island in Washington State, originally San Juan Island, kind of north of Seattle. and grew up out there, and one of my friends had lived out here when he was a little kid. And he always wanted to come back to Hawaii after graduating. He was a year older than me, so he left like ahead of ahead of time. And so I got to hear all the envious, you know, going through the Washington winter, hearing about Hawaii for that last year of high school was hard. Yeah, but so um, kind of ended up in a weird situation and just ended up out here like really lucky. Like he ended up buying me a plane ticket and came out with no money. And he had started working at a little glass shop. Um, uh, in Lahaina, Maui, um, in 95, I think he had started there. So I moved out in January 96 and almost immediately started working at that shop, um, just kind of painting gold on little dolphins and stuff like that. He was, you know, first first day in Maui, I watched him sit in the window and make, make a pterodactyl and angelfish and geckos and stuff out of glass. And it was pretty enthralling like right away i'd really only seen a guy at like the county fair flame work when i was a kid mm-hmm. and that was about hits even coming from washington being so close to pilchuck i'd never even heard of it you know growing up i didn't really you know sheltered from that so i missed all that so i had to come to hawaii to fall into glass <laughs> interesting and uh i did kind of grunt work around the shop for just a little bit and then right away just was able to um, basically just be, be paid by the hour to sit in the window and be on display and make glass and and wasn't given like a quota or any of those harsh things that a lot of those shops do a lot of the times. And I didn't have to learn spun glass, which was luckily it just kind of died out at that time. And uh, colored glass was just, you know, kind of new. And it was like we, we had a good stash of like North Star colors from like original batches of North Star colors at that shop that he had, that the old owner had bought a long time ago and played around with a bunch of that and it was kind of like we were told this very sparingly use the color but that was what interested me rather than making clear dolphins and sharks and whales and stuff like that that a lot of people did yeah so I, I got really into the, co- the colors right away heck yeah and so i just sat there in that window for 11 years or so <laughs> wow doing 12 hour shifts like seven days a week and i for a couple of those years, my buddy and I, we lived like right next door in Lahaina. Um, it was just a fun time. It was like super cheap rent and um, just making glass and living in Hawaii and hiking and body surfing. And it was pretty awesome. Hell yeah. And so, yeah, I just did that for a long time. And that shop kind of folded under. Got to work with a few other people over the years that, that were pretty awesome. Um, Jennifer Umpress uh, started working with me about eight years into that or something like that. And she was really one of the first people that was really super into glass and like would talk job with me. So that, that was pretty awesome. She, she went into it full on immediately. And then she took off and the shop folded not too long after that. And I've been working on my own ever since, but I feel pretty lucky that like I've been working with playing work glass long enough in Boro that, that I got to start when colors, you know, were so scarce and, and, you know, only 20 of them or something at the time, and, you know, yeah. cobalt and 
like exotic green and multi, you know, multi was the shit at the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I, I remember when blue moon came out, you know, yeah, me too. Blue moon. So awesome. Yeah. And then I remember getting the first batches of canary and, and lava and cherry. And, and we worked on a national three, a hand torch exclusively with hacker tips on there for, at that shop for that whole time. And so that was just like, it just didn't work. It just destroyed those colors, you know, it's so mm-hmm. hard to work with them and stuff. But I feel, you know, lucky that I was just kind of paid by the hours. So I got to just slowly like learn like and just kind of do whatever I wanted to do and make stuff and just play around. And, and the only thing that bumps me out is I never learned a uh, long box, really. I, I, I've worked solid the whole time, which I enjoy, but, you know, I have missed out on that. And I'm trying to get into that now and it's a little tricky to, you know, to become a beginner, beginner again. Yeah, it's a different ball of wax. It's interesting. It was like when I first got into the hot shop and did furnace work for the first time after blowing Boro, you know, and doing that, it was like, holy shit, this is crazy. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Holy I, shit. I, I, I do uh, sales at a, at a hot shop two days a week okay. um, where they also sell my class. And I do, so I do sales because I always did sales at that shop and behind it. That was part of working there. You did sales half the time and, and, uh, and did torch the other half. Pretty much. And so it's always been part of it for me actually selling the glass to tourists, which quite frankly, after 19 years is starting to wear me down <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like really badly. But I do work at a hot shop and, I, and yeah, they let me try it out a little bit. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's a whole other ball of wax. Yeah, but you know, it's amazing the amount of the skill sets you can get with for your hands you know and like learning the tools and stuff uh-huh. like it's a whole different setup but i've taken a lot of that knowledge and oh yeah continued it into my torch work you know it's amazing definitely and just watching them there's things that mm-hmm. uh that i've realized that like that make me think about things differently or or have um, been like oh yeah that's something i do and nobody taught me but but i see you doing you know the same thing i do a ton of marvering lately on my colors i'm layering colors and i do a lot of just like marvering those colors down to thin the layers into each other and it's just like watching somebody take a gather you know over their color and then have to you know even that gather out that layer over yeah, yeah. how they marver and i was really never never taught to do that that way because you know working in a shop we we're taught to be fast more than than anything but. yeah yeah exactly yeah i agree so from that point, I never got it, unfortunately. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Slow funny. Down. Yeah, I hear you, dude. So, so from that point on, then uh, just reading your bio and stuff. So your your fascination of the plant life from when you grew up as a kid to when I then going to Hawaii—that's like yeah. the mecca for freaking botanical anything. I mean, it's just fucking amazing out there. Yeah. So that's kind of yeah, like where it's you're at now. Beautiful. You know, I, I fell into, when I came out here, you see all the tropical flowers, of the gingers and heliconias, you know, like bird of paradise kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. And, and just amazing, you know, giant hibiscus and everything everywhere. And it's so, so beautiful and just kind of overwhelming. And, and they're so easy to grow. You just like rip out a chunk and throw it in the ground and it, and it grows, you know, <laughs> and a banana, like a banana, you do that and it's like this four foot leaf pops out every other day. And it's, it's pretty amazing to watch here. But as I got more into staring at plants, I started to notice that the, these rare ones that I was seeing in the books, uh, native Hawaiian, you know, stuff that was actually native to Hawaii, I realized all those gingers, all of that kind of stuff was not actually from Hawaii. Right, yeah, yeah. All the stuff that people take, take as being Hawaiian is not truly Hawaiian. And then when you talk to people, you get the idea that all the native stuff's dead and, you know, give it up and, you know, who cares? Like, it's all gone. And, and that was something we screwed up. But then you actually realize, no, it's it's actually most of that stuff in most of the world is still doing okay as long as we, you know, are smart about it and actually care about it. And that starts with knowing that it exists. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, so I, and so I've done tons of, like, volunteer work and stuff to get out in the forest over the years and to get to cool places and all that kind of stuff. And, and people always ask me if I work in conservation, if I work out in the field and stuff. They think that that's what I do because I'm such a geek about plants. I'm telling them all the species and stuff. I know more than the workers a lot of the time. Right. <laughs> and people actually work out there. And, uh, and, and I, you know, it would kind of ruin it a little bit, you know, for me actually working out there every day. And so I ch- at some point I tried to realize, like, where is my part in this? What can I do to try to help? And it's like, well, I can be that person who, who hopefully, you know, make somebody realize that it exists, you know, because cause so many people don't know, you know, just the, like the most common native Hawaiian tree, 
you know, and people on Maui don't know what it is. And it's, oh, wow. it's kind of odd, you know, it's, that's, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, I have no is. idea what that is. Huh. Um, so, so trying to bring it to, you know, and, and through my glass, you know, and eventually I luckily, you know, did it for long enough that I had the skills to, to pull off plants right around the time that I was getting more, more botanically, uh, inclined and stuff. And so that just kind of naturally was like, started doing that. Yeah. It's pretty and cool, unfortunately man. I haven't found any really success with that, you know, sales wise whatsoever. I, people, people like it and I love it and it's really fun every year to create them and stuff. But it's kind of like, I take two months out of my life to create these pieces that and everyone is just like stands like 10 feet back from because they're so afraid that it's, that it's too fragile. You're right. <laughs> and they don't realize that I spent the last two months, you know, in and out of a, you know, 6,000 degree torch and, you know, out of an oven back and forth. It's like, it must be pretty tough if it survived me. You know, I'm not, super gentle with them but yeah. but if you're going to make a plant or an insect or something like that shouldn't it be delicate you know if you have the skills to sort of make those welds correctly and make you know make things thin enough it sure seems like it's a good idea to actually try to do it you know yeah, a little I bit agree. more delicate because plants are delicate yeah exactly but, but it's been hard for me because no one wants to buy these things i can't even find you know galleries that will carry in my work most of my stuff is sitting at home Huh, that's crazy. I, so, I, I won, won the niche award for flame working last year. And it's like, I can't really even get anybody to show the piece, but I did. It's a leafy sea dragon you know, kind of thing. And it's 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 definitely very uh, uh, leafy <laughs> and crazy, but like I'm yeah. really not that worried about shipping it at all. Like, like uh, you know, as long as I know my welds are good. That was the very first thing I was taught by my friend who taught me with you to take my turtles and he go, oh, that's nice. And then he'd flick the fins off at me, <laughs> and and that got the point across. Oh man, I had the you same know, shit right happen away. to me, dude. That's so funny. Yeah, 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 totally. You know, because you're selling to tourists, and like it, you know, to people who their only connotation with glass is their mom yelling at them not to touch it. <laughs> yeah. You oh, know? And, oh yeah. And and so then if you make them afraid of it by by making something shoddy, mm -hmm. you know, it's then you. you they don't blame you as the glass artist. They blame glass, you know, in general. So it's like you shoot all of us in the foot by yeah. making a bad product. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, too, thinking about, like, the correlation to the functional glass scene. Like, for the longest time, I was always wanting to get, like, really detail and, like, make, you know, fragile pieces in a sense. And I always stayed away from it because I was worried about more form over function and stability. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I started seeing some stuff coming out. I was like... The guy that's like mm -hmm. looks so fragile and so you know whatever not stable and but then it was selling for a shitload of money and it was being consistently selling for more money and more money and you know like yeah. look, you know look at Buck's work that's out there it's like his stuff's freaking crazy but it looks like it could just fall apart but it's really really mm -hmm. strong and durable. That's still he's still working with a certain size yep. that, you know it's once you get below like two mil <laughs> stuff stuff gets a lot more fragile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. and he's definitely staying above that level. He's yeah. right there. He's got so many components that it it looks scary, but as long as the welds are good, you know, glass is so strong. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can take you know three little like make like a trident you know out of you know kind of thing out of like one two mil glass. And as long as your welds are perfect, like, put, you know, try to bend that with your fingers and break it in between, you know, and that's, it's so incredibly strong. Like, like it takes a lot of force to break it, but if your weld is just slightly off or you, you, or you boiled it or, you know, yeah. it, or, you know, something like that, yeah. you know, it, just a few things can go wrong to cause that, to, you know, to, to be that much more fragile. And yeah. really all that is, is you know, laziness most of the time. You know, not not having the time to go back and 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 re you know weld that you know make that weld perfect, especially now with hand torches. Like mm -hmm. I can't believe I I worked with a hand torch for without one for you know I think I only got one like four or five years ago. Dude, I got mine like, like oh eight God. months. Yeah, I got mine like eight months ago, bro. I'm like, what the fuck have I been waiting for really? so long? Like, what the really? hell? Yeah, dude. Like I could do some welds yeah, on my car. And I bought it off but... of Amazon. <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. What the like hell? It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it's, I, I've been basically, I've actually bought one for, for several friends just because they didn't think it was required kits. And I'm like, you'll see, you'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's a bat and a blow hose. You have to have it. Yeah, you got to. It's a, it's a requirement for sure. Man, that's yeah, crazy. it just should be there. It's a little dangerous, too. I just, you know, I just helped uh, Wesley Fleming. I, I, I was teacher day, the studio assistant for him at Penland. And and every all the students had in hand torches. It was definitely. Uh, I think we had a couple of tweezers laid down on them. Yeah, actually, and yeah, some classes it might not be the best idea for everybody to have hand torches. Yeah, it's like a bunch of lightsabers around a studio or something. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, shit. yeah, that too. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen anybody burn, burn yet. I, I I'm really close to getting myself these little orchids that I'm making lately. I'm just pointing it right back in my fingers and stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, thinking more about the peace in my body. Yeah. Yeah, the sacrifices we make, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I haven't got myself in a, I mean, I burnt myself last night, but not bad. day, just on the kiln. But but I haven't, I haven't got myself with the torch in quite some time. Good. Yeah, same here, man. Okay. Knock, on, knock on wood. For mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, man. So have you got, have you looked at like conservatories or, you know, botanical exhibits or like, do you guys have like flower shows there or anything like that? Uh, I mean, I, I have, you know, I've, I've definitely thought about that plenty, but out here, those things, you know, are, are so underfunded okay. that it's, it's really like you got to do everything. And I'd have to like do, go to another island or something, you know, to do it. It's, it's not super easy on the island here. And in these pieces that when I'm doing the native ones and stuff, I'm spending, like I said, you know, it's a month, you know, making them. And it's just so many little bits and pieces and doing all the, the sort of research ahead of time. And I usually you know, want to go out hiking and actually see the plant again and try to get close to it and realize that I needed to take a picture of the, you know, where the leaf needs to stem or you know, how the roots grow or something like that, that you can never find a picture of online. Because yeah, you yeah. need to look at the underside of the back of it or something that you realize it doesn't. It's kind of a crucial thing. Trying to find that because I don't, I don't, I can't make them perfectly accurate like the Blaschkas did. Yeah, I was going to ask not, about I'm that. I'm not an alien, right? You know? <laughs> um, so, so I'm trying to fudge it, but you try to find the, the something, you know, the whatever it is that captures the flow of that thing that well, makes the, it look like that. You know, and it's yeah, yeah. It's they have tricky, some... so it's a lot of experimentation. Yeah, I can imagine, dude. Especially using the colors you're using, but they, but they have, they still have this. Oh shit! I hit my microphone. I'm making all kind of fucking noise here. They, uh, I'm like an Italian in here talking about my hands and shit. Um, but yeah, they, they definitely have like a, a such a sense of realism to them. Like there was, I remember when I was first looking at your work years ago, and I came across it. And I was like, oh my god! It took a couple of double takes at your work to realize that it was actually glass. And uh, it's like you're saying with that exhibit at Harvard. You know, it's like it's amazing how people can create glass of that way yeah. to be studied by fucking scientists like yeah we're gonna create fetuses. i got to go there last year and it hurt it kind of hurt my brain like <laughs> i could and imagine. i and I, I know it was it was crazy for me because i know a bunch of the plants that intimately they had like um like five or six plants that are in my backyard here in hawaii because he, he did it he went to um to jamaica at one point so he, he's got all these tropical species and there's just I'm looking at them and I can see all the little things that I notice. You know, it's just like that's stupid, but that's there. Like, how did they do that? You know, yeah. but they had one benefactor that paid for their entire career. Mm-hmm. You know, their whole lives. Yeah. And I wish I had that. I could do some pretty awesome stuff if somebody would fund me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the thing. I'm so stoked to see that. That's what's so great about the the you know what's happening in flame working right now and what's happened in the pipes it's like everybody's finally getting paid mm-hmm. for what what they deserve and and so they're actually getting to make these cool pieces that that everybody would have got to make one of and then it would have sat in their you know case like like i'm doing right now you know and and then they never get to make another one because they have to go back to making spoons you know or for me turtles you know geckos you know whatever pays the bills yeah kind of thing because unfortunately life does get in the way at some point <laughs> yeah for sure you know, and you got to pay the bills so but yep. then it's trying to maintain that balance of paying the bills and having fun and paying the soul and yep. making the pieces that aren't worth it and you know because there's always going to be those pieces if you're not making those pieces that, that aren't making any money then you're 
kind of not an artist, I guess. I don't know. You have to do them because you have to do them. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yep. Because they're just going to come out one way or another. Yeah, it's like an author trying to but write a book. But if you're so book. down from being broke... What's yeah. that, I was just saying, it's like an author having to write a book. Like you have these, you know, this story in your head. You just gotta get it out and you gotta put it on paper. Yeah. Whether you get paid or not. Yeah, it's interesting though, man. Because yeah. like I know, like through, do it, but yeah. I know early on in my career when I was first going and and I started off just with the, with the art of it and the sculptor and stuff. But I'm the guy that taught me initially. Then uh, introduced me to another glass artist, this guy Daniel Sharp, who gave me some basic foundations for my glass blowing techniques. But it was like. Every time I was making this shape of a spoon, I'm like, oh, man, this thing would be a really pretty perfume bottle. But then I'm like, well, I know I can make a pipe and sell it. Where the perfume bottle, I might make 50 of them and sell two yeah. over like six months. Yeah. But I can make 100 pipes and sell them tomorrow, you know, kind of thing. So it's always that, yeah. you know, that stupid struggle, which I, I, I don't like, but it's just the reality of how business is. It's, you know? it's, it's always just, there. It's always there, and I think anyone who thinks that, like, all the, you know, you take your favorite artist or whatever who who you think is super highbrow, and they probably have, like, an account at Walmart, you know, that, that, that like, they're selling, you know, corporate artwork or doing photography for them, you know, mm-hmm. something like that, that they just never advertise, you know, but that's how they're actually making the, you know, paying the bills. Everybody's got to make, you know, they, they got to make their small stuff, and that's how you get the skills. Yeah, to, to exactly. make, you know, in glass, you know, all these people, uh, you know, one of your interviews who are talking about kind of going right to, you know, a lot of these guys jumping right up into selling stuff really big. And it's like, you know, you don't, you don't even know what, you know, there's how many color companies out there there are, mm. you know, so how it's like, you're good, but you're not, I don't know, you know, I don't know. Cause art, it should just be art. It should be whatever you can get away with. And it's cool. Yeah, to an but extent. But in glass, there just has to be a lot of technique behind it. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Yeah, you got to have a foundation. I want to see, I want to see good seals, good welds, good color, all that stuff, just as much as I want to see, um, you know, see something creative too. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, it needs to be clean, you know. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, even you know, you know, you, you start to see like certain colors that people use, you know, that are kind of like easier to use. Stuff like that, you see things different when you're an artist. You're like, oh, that's kind of the cheater color, you know, something that's a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. know. What you mean. Yeah, I know what you mean for sure. You, you know, you I, look at things different. And when you see somebody using a hard color to use, you know, you get them way more props because you know how you know that's way more awkward to do than that one color. That, yeah, exactly. You know, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of funny too, man, because like I see a lot of work out there, and I, you see the pictures of them, and just and that's all you see, and it's like, holy shit, that thing's amazing. But then when when you see it in person, it's like half the size of what you think it was, and then there's like a scratch here and there or something weird that you didn't expect yeah, to see in the picture. You know, pretty but, rough. you know, like I we have the uh, Chihuly collection here in town, and you know I've seen a lot of his work in person, but like when we were installing this collection, I was like looking at stuff that had scuff marks on it. I'm like pretty sloppy. Yeah, I'm like, how in the hell is this a $9 million collection? It's like, we got all of his seconds and our offhand yeah. stuff, you know, but it's like... When when we were at, when we were at Corning, we were in the, the, the um, we got sort of a back behind the scenes tour in the conservatory where they were like repairing and restoring pieces and, and uh, um, and they, there was a jewelry somebody had just donated because when they were cleaning it, they found and just gone right through it because it was so paper thin. Oh, wow. And it was like, you know, it was like a, you know, probably you know, triple, you know, hundred thousand dollar piece at least, or yeah. something crazy, and it was just blowing so thin. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like to see. So that to me, if you love, if you're really loving everything, you should have put your hands sort of all over that piece at some point and like looked at it and like, I feel like I do that at just about everything that comes out of the kiln. Like, you know, I'm still even when I just make dumb little frit pendants or something where. Mm-hmm you know, so boring and so basic to me or whatever, I'm still excited to open the kiln and see what they look like in the morning, you know. Yeah, I love that shit. Even after I remember watching a video of Tihuly breaking pieces and him just like breaking individual pieces and it was just like, and he didn't care. It's yeah. like, it like, oh, I like the curve on that one, you know, I'd be so bummed that that one broke. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I can't believe, you know, that you would just like, like, I don't know. And I get the, the whole thing. Some, it's a different way of thinking that the whole thing is the whole thing and doesn't matter. And it's the beauty of looking at it from afar or something. It doesn't have to be. I don't know. Seems like if you're putting something for over $100,000, you shouldn't get to put your 
come to it. Yeah, exactly. And that's I think you know, that's what's or click off the fence. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I think the, is the beauty with with uh, the functional glass scene really is because not only are you buying the piece because of function, but you're buying it because then you sit there and you look at this thing up up close and personal and really get it become intimate with the art of it and really yeah. know it inside and out. And if there's any flaws or anything weird in that, you're going to find them. But at the same time, for some people, oh. they love the flaws. They like the fact that it's got a flaw because it's now, yeah. you know, it makes it original oh, yeah. or one of a kind or, you know. Well, nothing will ever be perfect. There's yeah. always going to be, and, and God, I'll pick out, you know, a million wrong things with everything on my pieces. You right. know, come on. <laughs> 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 kind of thing, yeah. Um, but but yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Going. So, how was that class that you and Wesley did? What was that? That was at Penland. You said. Or yeah, Penland? yeah, it was really fun. Uh, well, we we basically did the same thing last year at Corning too. Okay. Uh, that was my first time um, actually meeting Wesley. We'd be friends from the you know the old school lamp workers discussion board from way back in the day. And, uh, and so he, he asked me to do that last year and then asked me to do it again. It's just been really fun. I love, I love traveling and I don't get to do it much uh, recently. So it's just a good excuse to get out there and get sort of be a Corning, be a Pinland, get your name in those places. You know, I feel like I'm a little isolated out here doing what I'm doing and yeah. the scene's getting so big and I'm sort of out here by myself. So it's like, I need to, you got to get my, my name out there, get my face out there, get my glass out there, um, all that kind of stuff. So, so that was, it felt like a really good opportunity to go do that. And, and, uh, most of the times so it's been really fun. I mean, Wesley's amazing. If you, don't, you know, if anybody doesn't know his work, go check it out. Wesley Fleming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. at, at Vetro Bob on Instagram. Yeah. And yeah, he's just like, it's, it's amazing. It's kind of tricky because a class like that, he's one of, it's one of those things that it's like, man, you got to sit here for, you know, 10 years to be able to make a, a weld like that. It's like what he's doing in soft glass. It, it has to be done perfect, you know, right the first time to do it that small. And, but everybody can pull something off, and it, and it was really fun, really cool to see. Nice. It's tricky for me because I don't work in soft glass, and he does. And so the teacher said, I did not try trying that and totally feel like a beginner and again and everything. <laughs> so, yeah. It was, it was definitely tricky. Yeah, Twenty little amazing. burns on my arms from already rods exploding. Oh um, man, a couple of months. I guess it was two months ago. I was work, working over at Disney and um, in the Mexican Pavilion at Epcot is where I was when I first started working there. Was my home base, and now we have our jewelry makers, the bead makers that are, do all of our uh, our stuff that's in there. Mm. And uh, so I went there to cover cover a shift on a Sunday, and my manager knew I was going, but didn't send any borrow there. Is all soft glass, and I was on ready. So, uh-huh. so I just uh-huh. did like mandrel bead work all day, and it was really yeah. the, oh, dude, I was like, I made a fucking mess, you know, everywhere. There was, yeah, you know, little shit. Have you ever done it before? Uh, not too much, really. I've done some stuff, but I was always like, this stuff. I don't like this. Yeah. Shit. I'm burning it's, it, you know. It's fun. Oh yeah, it was a challenge. It's fun. It's different. The colors are beautiful. Oh man, the palette's incredible. I know. Yeah. So it was. They it was, all have their pros and cons. I got to play around with a couple of rods of like cooler color, like ninety six COE, what they're like working on the furnace mm-hmm. that Wes had, and I liked that a lot better. That felt kind of, you know, a little bit more stable to me. And the colors were still, you know, vibrant and beautiful and, and really cool. But you know, and then I thought that would be actually interesting to learn because then potentially people could actually incorporate it into the furnace work could be Oh yeah, that's Could true. Be cool. Yeah, yeah, doing some, yeah, doing slump work or whatever, all kind of stump sucking stuff and everything else with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of uh, most of that stuff's in that range from the Mount Yeah, you know, it's it's just the colors are just so different than Boro, so it's yeah. always fun to see when you're used to your color palette and how yeah. crazy <laughs> yeah, totally. it can be. Yeah, it was weird, man. Like certain colors, transparent colors, I was using that like. I don't. I guess I burnt them out, and they got like gray and op- more opaque than I was expecting them to come out. And trying to burn off that, uh-huh. that you know, that burn that I did made it even worse, you know. So I had like these awesome yeah. purples that were then gray and brown afterwards. You know, it was it was uh-huh. a, it was a ton of fun, especially when you're in front of people watching you. I was just like, oh, yeah. you know, the whole day I was like, fuck this, I'm gonna have yeah. fun and just do it. You know, are, are you mess. good with that? You must be good with that because I I never was. I, I did it for 11 years at that shop, and I never, ever got used to people, like, staring at me. I'm, like, a private kind of person, doesn't really like, 
I, I don't know. It was it was hard for me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting, and what I find too is that because we have three different places that we do work there. Like I started off at the Renaissance Festival, so it was already like thrown into the wolves with demonstration huh. stuff, you know. Um, but oh, yeah. then you know with the Disney thing, I mean, I literally when I was in Mexico, we would have like. 40,000 plus people come through in like two, three days, you know, come through our store. Wow. And no, not everybody stood there and watched, but there was times where I had like 50, yeah. you know, 60 people crammed into our yeah. store watching me make Olaf or whatever I'm making. And, you know, uh-huh. like, I always find like the first piece That's of... That's almost anonymous though at that point though. That's so many. Yeah. Like... Yeah. For sure. It's it's weird. But like I always find no matter where I'm at working there, the very first piece I'm always overly anxious and a little nervous about. Uh-huh. And then once I get uh-huh. past that first piece, I'm good to go. But it's getting through the first piece from the very beginning that like yeah. kind of sets my whole day off. But it's also I find like I'm it's I don't know, it's weird. It's a weird thing. Yeah. I'm all I'm I'm really shaky around anyone for the first time. Like or the first time of the day even, same thing. Mm-hmm. Like it's weird it's, if, if it's just like um, friends, like somebody who doesn't do glass, like nothing, I'll just be like, I'll just start working. And like my hands are a little shaky anyway, but, but uh, when, when I get like just somebody new, or I did a demo at AGI years ago, and you know, it was like just, you know, hundreds of my peers in the audience and, you know, first time meeting Robert Nicholson and Lewis Wilson watching and, you know, that, Steve Size Love is there, you know, everybody had, and I was so nervous. I'm in the rods are just clinging, you know, two inches, you know, like trying to, you know, stick one, one end to another end, and it was like I hit it two inches up the rod or something. <laughs> but yeah, give it a couple of minutes, and it usually fades. Oh, shit. I'm a little bit nervous for my upcoming class I'm going to be teaching in Seattle um, in November, because I'm like that it's it was my first first time teaching a real a real class even i've taught so many people over the years and stuff but okay. uh, i'm i'm worried that i'm gonna i'm gonna look real shaky for the first 15 minutes or so hopefully people give me that give me that little bit to yeah. finally look like i'm a professional yeah get your warm-up you know i always find like that kind of situation when i'm teaching classes i'll, I'll go ahead and get started on the torch before this class starts so like as the students are filing in, I'm already on yeah. the porch and they're like coming in and getting to yeah. and you know, I'm just like saying hi to everybody as they're coming in, you know, it's it kinda, right on. Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking about doing because that's, that actually usually helps too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you're already doing, you know, rather than just getting on when you're, when you're on, everybody's staring at you. Yeah. When you're cold yeah. and they're looking for you being yeah. nervous and is, is he nervous? Is he shaking? Cause he's got too much coffee in him. And like, the, you know, these, they start questioning. Yeah. You, or at least you think they're questioning. Yeah. I'm going to be, <laughs> Oh yeah, so they are. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Well, yeah, man. We'll but get... I think everybody's stoked to see everything. So you know, I'm I'm just stoked to watch anybody anytime. So yeah, I'm in the same boat. You know, that's the way I go to those things just to watch. So yeah. Well, hey, dude, tell us about the class a little bit more. Talk, get kind of explain about that because you got a platform here to talk. Yeah. About. Um, I've been teaching people over the years. You know, at that shop, kind of anybody who would come in new and start, I'd, I'd kind of give them the training, you know, and, and most of the people, like I said, were kind of just doing it as a job, you know, super into it and stuff until, until Jennifer Umphus started working there and, mm-hmm. and, uh, got, got to give her some of her, you know, first couple of years of instruction. She you know, took off right away and she's taught me, you know, probably more than I taught her over the years. Um, but, but got to give her first instruction. And then my friend, Nathan Belmont, who's here on the island, um, Got to you know kind of teach him over the years a little bit and, and at that shop and stuff too, and he's actually going to come along and TA for me, so so that's cool to have a little backup too um, because we kind of do a little the shop that we all started out of we we put on color a little different we we encase things different and I just for some reason I've never seen anybody else do it exactly the same way and I don't understand why because it seems like it's a good way to do it hmm. it seems like everything's been done. I'm sure there are other people that do it, but, but, um, so just to have a different, slightly different mentality coming from that background of it. So, so I think it'll be really, uh, helpful for people, um, this whole sculptural knowledge set, you know, that I have, um, to teach. I, 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 I hopefully I can impart that on people. And, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure you will. And, um, yeah, I'm, you know, I like to blab. If you can't tell, so, hey, yeah, Blavin's good. And I'm talking. <laughs> so what? And, kind of... You know, I, I 
I like to when I when I like to get talked up. I like you know a, a, a deep description of something. I don't like just the answer of something. Mm-hmm. I I'm a, a big fan of the Carl Sagan quote of to, to make an apple pie from scratch, you have to create the universe first. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's, there's there's always a little few few other things behind it. So mm-hmm. you know if you can explain to me that the the glass you know the yellow likes to boil you know because cadmium you know is cadmium in it it likes to you know sublime at 1700 degrees and you're working it above that and so if you can baby it a little bit you know that actually makes more sense than just saying the yellow glass doesn't like to be overheated yeah exactly you know what i mean like like i i kind of i i like a little bit more description so i i hopefully i can you know other people like that as well and it's not too long-winded (laughs) <laughs> no, no, dude, and, it's, and then when it comes down to it, like you got, you know, there's so much science involved in this glass world. Besides the engineering and everything else involved in it, you got to know properties and why things do what they do. Why does Crayola colors or the crayon colors, whatever I fucking call them, why do the cadmiums boil like they do, or you know, why do certain colors reduce? Mm-hmm. Why do certain colors overstrike or understrike? Why does silver work the way it does? Why does gold mm-hmm. work? You know, it's like you can, yeah. you can give some. And some, it used to just be magic. You know, yeah, but totally. like now we actually can learn. People are finally sharing all that knowledge. Yeah. So it's like, let's all share it, you know, as much as we can. Yeah, the alchemy is so there's a lot of there's a lot of myths and outright lies and bullshit out there in the glass world. And, yeah. you know, and there there is always a little bit of magic to everything we do. So that's, you know, that's why everybody says, oh, don't, you know, don't kill them. Just, I've heard it for so many years. You can't put green in the kiln for more than like a day or something like that. And I've had my pieces in my hundreds of hours and I use I use more green than most people because I make plants. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, but it's it's different than making than um than blown work. You know, mm-hmm. I, I had you know made this awesome Sherlock the other day, so stoked on it and and it totally cracked. Yeah. And and it's because I use this like sparkly green mix that I made up and I'm mixing my own colors together. And uh and I think it would work fine in solid. But I think the the sort of the, the way that hollow stuff heating, reheating, the structure of that, the thinness, the getting up back to ten fifty, cooling off, you know, all that creates different stress than, than it does on something that's solid. It's actually yeah. a very a different, you know. There there are fundamental differences to working solid to working hollow. Yeah, completely. Especially the fact that you're stretching the medium itself, you know, like expanding the molecule structure and then Going beyond a point yeah. where it was even manufactured at exactly. you know, the beginning of it, you know, it's like, oh my god, what the and fuck then, is this? And then reheating it and, yeah. com- and compress that again, and then blowing it out again. Yeah, exactly. It's like those those like little molecule lines are stretched, you know, and frayed and stretched and frayed. And I think there's a certain strain point that it's hard to come back from. Mm-hmm. You know, when you when you if you've incorporated, you know, just stress things out too far there's no coming back from it yeah exactly it gets that you know, weird memory that, yeah so so you never know it's, there's always there's i mean look at lino talia pietra you know working on 80 years old i watched him at the tacoma glass museum work on his 80th birthday it's like there's always more stuff to learn yeah there's you know that you you could should be able to create new stuff and constantly you know anybody who just says oh well that's the way you know that's the, i found this way works for me you know, it's like if that's that's the end of your learning, then you know that's the end of your art. I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, there's, man. There's a million more things to do. Oh yeah, it's crazy. It's amazing. Like every day, I learn something new. Even if it's just like a fine tuning a technique or using my left hand instead of my right hand for something. Like just little stupid shit that comes up. It's like, wow, I didn't even think about that. You know, it's 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 pretty cool. Yeah, I, I definitely dig it. Yeah, definitely. So and uh, that's that's okay. what I love about taking classes. You know, and, and going to these things is is not necessarily. I'm gonna, you know, the first day I'm gonna I'm gonna teach leaps and and because um, that's I think it's a really good way to learn uh, layering color the way I do it. So all my leaps are like three layers of color usually, hmm. so you just get this you know really interesting depth, and you can come up with so many color combos and things. So I'm gonna work on that, and then orchids and plants and things like that. And I think you know those sort of little fundamentals you get, you know, by, by doing something simple back and forth. And that's going to be at the, uh, at the Boro school in Seattle, November 7th to 9th for anybody. There's still open slots and my brother Anthony Belmont's coming. He does awesome, crazy sculptural stuff and totally different styles than I do, but, but 
uh, still in a similar theme and, and we work in a similar way. So if I can't answer questions, he's going to be there to answer them. Nice. So it should be fun. Yeah, man, I'm stoked. Yeah, just kind of a real quick, interesting story. You mentioned Jennifer Umphress. She uh, mm -hmm. was a catalyst into me getting my job at Disney, kind of a thing. Um, mm -hmm. When I was first like learning, because I, I started off with sculpture, but then I re really jumped into the hollow glass, and my fine-tuning skills from my sculpture work really wasn't there, and I knew the Disney gig was mostly sculpture. Like We don't do a lot of blown glass there, mm -hmm. except for in the furnace area. Um, I did do some, like, uh -huh. I did like a hand blown slipper and I did Cinderella's carriage. Like there were some things I did that were blown glass, but most of it's all sculpture. Mm -hmm. And at the time mm -hmm. I was really learning how to make octopus and, or octopi. And I saw Jennifer's mm -hmm. work and was just like completely blown away by how amazing her octopus are. And, uh, yeah. you know, so I was like trying to find my way in that, in that of my style and what I was going for. And I could almost find it. And I was like, I hit her up one day. I was like, you know, asking her some specific questions, and she gave me very specific detailed answers on response on how to further my, you know, my learning what I'm doing and figuring it out. And it got to a point where I was awesome. like, you know, when I did my interview, my initial going there and showing on my work, I had this amazing, really nice octopus sculpture that I made. And that was really what helped mm -hmm. me get in there was that, they, you know, they could see, because a lot of the stuff we sell there is sea life and fish sculptures and turtles uh -huh. and what have you. So that was like uh -huh. a big octopus. point. In, shows you got skill too because it's not that's not an easy critter yeah exactly yeah so pull off. yeah i agree i agree so i was definitely once i got the job and i was i was actually given the the yes i got the gig like three months later she was the first person that i hit up as like a, you know thank you so much for you know your insight <laughs> kind of thing you know so, yeah right on so knowing that she got her skills in a sense and foundation through you it's kind I, of a fun I little circle probably showed her how to make up this, I'm assuming, because yeah. I've, I've made them forever, you know, but her style is so different, you know, like I said, she she immediately, like, knew that's what she was doing, and just took it to a whole nother level, Yeah, and yeah, her, 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 she really started doing those, those kind of octopus a little bit more after she moved to Seattle. Okay. Yeah, yeah she's doing amazing stuff now, she's gotten to a whole nother level of doing cast work, and all yeah. kinds of cool stuff, she's, she's a real artist. Yeah, it's pretty neat. She's neat. So what other uh, extracurricular activities in uh, Hawaii are you into? Mainly just hiking, getting outdoors. You know, I'm not as much of a beach person, but I do enjoy that a little bit. But definitely, you know, I got a day off. I'm thinking about going up to the jungle, getting up on a ridge somewhere in the mud and in and, and the scratchy ferns and working with my through my crazy zoom lens at a plant growing a thousand foot up on a wall and trying to figure out what species it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's all awesome. yeah, yeah, that kinda crazy. Yeah. yeah. It sounds incredible, dude. Oh, it's, it's fucking yeah. awesome. You gotta keep yourself entertained somehow. Like like you know, it is a it is an island. There you know, the, it's got a ten thousand foot tall mountain and a six thousand foot tall mountain. So there's a lot of room to explore, but it's still it's still pretty small. So it's like you get stuck doing the same trails with some you know going to the same place all the time and you can't leave the island easy so like you got to find a way to make it entertaining and being into plants is like making every every hike everything's a treasure hunt i'm like i got something i'm kind of looking for and yeah I'm, yeah I... having all these cool endemic plants makes it makes it really interesting yeah, it's fascinating. I know, like, when I travel, I try to find botanical gardens wherever I'm going just for native plants in that area because I'm mm -hmm. the same way. I'm a big plant nerd. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when we went down to Honduras and came across, they had a botanical thing there, and it was, like, you know, just completely mind-blowing. This like the size of the ginger plants yeah. and the hibiscus and everything. It was just, like, oh, yeah. you know, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, the bromeliads. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, the tropics are a whole other thing. I, I, I grew up watching National Geographic and all that stuff. And any time I remember there was jungle things, you know, tropical things, that was definitely always what I was really interested in. And and so I, when I came here, I remember my, my like, first real day up in the jungle, I was kind of like, I think it was still January, and I'm sitting in a river eating a guava. It, it, was, it was just kind of, yeah, I, I knew that this was the place. You know, 5,000-foot cliffs on either side, water, you know, 1,000-foot water top fall over here. And, you, know, you know, just, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty epic all around, you know, just, just looking out in the backyard. I still never fail to, to, to realize how beautiful it is here. I, it is bumming me out, though. It is, it is you know, it, it, I keep telling everybody, everybody, when I tell people I'm from Hawaii, I always get the sort of like a, 
like, oh, so poor you, kind of thing, you know, and, or, or they're jealous or whatever. And it has, its, you know, it's definitely got its cons here too. And I'm, I'm thinking about even leaving here at some point just because it's, it's not good for glass. You know, my, my career is not getting any further here. And I was telling you, Oxy is, I haven't bought it in a long time, but I had a, had somebody new to the island went in and air gas quoted them $190 for a K tank. It's crazy. For a fill. <laughs> And and liquids above eight hundred for <laughs> for the smaller one. So oh uh, you know, God. I had to. I, I got a concentrator seven years ago or something, and took my tanks into them and like you know flipped them off and walked away because I hate those guys. Mm-hmm. They're not only are they too expensive, but they're like one of the worst businesses I've ever dealt with. Anyway, they're no fun. Yeah, and it's fucking. And up, so it makes it really really work. hard out here. Yeah, they just treat you like dirt. Well, dude, you know? that's anywhere. I'm, I'm that's, oh shit, that, that's like really. Oh yeah, I thought I, it was just Hawaii because I was a Howley. Oh no, dude, I was getting treated that like dirt. But... No, it's everybody. They they immediately yeah. they're like yeah they're and it sucks because they have like a monopoly in this country for being the oxygen suppliers. Mm-hmm. I fortunately have a mom and pop mm-hmm. I deal with, and they they get their shit filled mm-hmm. at air gas, but I deal directly with the mom and pop that I've been dealing with for over ten years, and they're uh-huh. awesome, you know. Nice. So it makes a big difference, you know. Yeah, pressing was. There's just not the there's not the the call for it out here. There's not the volume of use, so right. it's it's just there's nobody doing it. So so it makes it hard for me. You know, I mean, this concentrator I have, I have this Vigali, Vigalia is what it's called. Uh, um, I got it from Kimberly Horn mm-hmm. at Pyronamics, um, and it's a ten liter per minute unit. It works really good, and um, but it's still you know I've got a Phantom and a GTT. And it, it only runs the, you know, the center fire, the links at probably like 75%, okay. you know, of what, what a, what a links could be. Yeah. But the, I can't, I can turn on the outer oxygen a little bit. So it actually feels hotter than just a links to me. But for 99% of what I do, even if I was on tank oxygen, that's actually fine for me. Yeah. The detail but, stuff. Um, yeah. Makes sense. But now, now that I'm trying to get into bone work, and you know, I've been trying to make pipes these last couple months, and and it's just like, man, I need a big bushy fluffy flame, and I can't get it. You know, there's just no way. You know? And so I need to, and I need to get one of those invest in the high volume oxygen thing. I've been thinking about that for a long time. But yeah, yeah, it's but, a, uh, it's a good investment. Up and down. Yeah, definitely. I'll get I'll get it soon enough. Hell yeah. Cause there's no other option out here, so. <laughs> yeah, but, man. you know, I don't mind. I, I like what I do. I like making small little plants and stuff, and it's different. And I'm, I'm really hoping that that a lot of these people that seem to be only interested in functional stuff, they realize that, you know, you got your daily driver piece that you hit, and you're all stoked on, and then you can set it down, and you can stare at my piece that isn't necessarily functional, but is really cool. You know, mm-hmm. you could have it sitting on the shelf there and enjoy <laughs> it, you know, and, and the you know the what's so cool about what what you know what the pipe movement is doing is people finally know what flame works glass is. Yeah, exactly. Because you know I deal I deal with tourists all day long, and like nobody knows what you know what glass is, and then they really don't like flame works glass. You know, I mean they they like it, but but they don't see the worth in it. it. It's not big and heavy, and it looks delicate, and it has just a lot of things going against it for the average person to sort of you know. Yeah. To not make it feel like a good value proposition to them, you know, and they just don't understand how long it took you to, you know, do this and get good at it and all these things that just don't have any connotation with. But the pipe scene is just training people, you know, to to understand. You know, I if I see somebody under, you know, under thirty, under you know, under twenty come into my shop and they got a beard and tattoos, like I I know that like I, I you know somebody's going to be stoked on what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. like almost everybody, else, almost everybody else is like a total crapshoot. What, what kind of attitude I'm going to get from them about it? You know, some people are affronted by the price. You know, it's, oh my god, is this sixty dollars? Yeah. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Spent twenty years getting to the point where I can make that. Yeah, exactly. They should have another zero next to it. Honestly. Yeah, I'm starting to feel like that's what I have to do. Like, like that. The only thing that's holding me back is just that I'm not like owning the fact that my pieces should be have two extra zeros on them. Mm-hmm. 
something in it, and then maybe people will care that they're precious. You know, I don't, I don't well, know. yeah, dude, that's the whole thing. It's like that perception. Like I, I remember yeah. when I was doing the whole True Holy thing, and I was, I was really studying because I did, I did all of our education programs and did, did like the yeah. docent training and tours and stuff, and doing like a lot of studying on like his marketing and his life, and like it took him thirteen years to sell his first really big piece. But yeah. Yeah. He, but he had to go to the ga- the museums he was selling to or the galleries that the shit was consigned at or whatever and went in there and added zeros to everything and sold every fucking thing in, that was in there to sell. Yeah. Just by adding a zero yeah. because it, it meant that this yeah. thing is more valuable whether and it is or not. all of a sudden it's, it's worth it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. It's so yeah, weird. And it, and it is. It is worth it, you know? Yeah. It's like it, it is and it isn't, you know? It's not worth anything, so it's worth whatever it is. Yeah, you know? exactly. If, if somebody's doing something that they love and doing it cool and making it good and, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. You know, and art, art, Andy Warhol said art is what you can get away with. And I always, you know, think that that works pretty well yeah it does absolutely it's that whole concept too like if you're you know because we are a trade also as a being a flame worker you know in a sense so you know you think about like a plumber or a welder or an electrician who's been doing it for 20 years they're making like 200 bucks an hour so we should be doing the same thing if we've got that much time and experience yeah. into what you're doing you know i would hope yeah yeah and still yet i second guess myself and feel like i'm in art you know class in high school and like really you want to buy my my thing I made. Yeah, it you is. Know? It's and, kind and of I fun. should not have that attitude because I've been doing it for long enough. But, yeah. but I don't know. I still care about it enough that I feel like that. You know, it's like I still feel personal and precious and small, and it's hard to turn it into this into a corporate thing. You know? Or, yeah, it is definitely. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's an interesting parody. You know, it's the whole like I want to be confident and know my value of my work, but then I want to be not so confident because I'm not sure if I am confident, you know, it's like the whole imposter syndrome thing, you know, it's kind of a weird, I don't know. It's a predicament that mm-hmm. I sometimes don't like and don't want to deal with it. And so I just, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, <laughs> so, which is yeah. why I have distributors sometimes, you know, that I deal with makes it easier. Yeah. I'm starting to realize, I think I need somebody else to speak for me, you know, sometimes because, mm-hmm. you know, to the, to the right people I can talk, I can talk about myself to the end client, but not to the shops. And, you know, I don't know. I don't have really any relationships with any shops right now because nobody has ever really done well with me or worked with me all that great. And and then it's just hard to do anything on the mainland. There's there's only so many things to do out here. So many galleries, places to actually work with on the island. Yeah. And then it's really hard to deal with anybody else. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, just so you know, man, we are at the 52-minute mark. Right on. Hey, um, yeah, actually, my mom was just asking me if I, if I could answer a question for her. Yeah, yeah. Let me, since we're out of pause point here, hold on. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, my, like, uh, i got to give a shout-out to my mom. Like, I wouldn't be able to make anything that I make if it wasn't for her. Like, I'm a single dad right now, and... And if she wasn't my backup, like I, I would be, uh, it'd be really, really tricky. So, hell yeah. You know, but it's tough maintaining, maintaining those things all the time, trying to figure out, make everybody happy, and trying to work and do this and take a break and stuff. Yeah, man, work-life balance is really hard when you're self-employed. It's, it's such a tricky thing. Like I hear it all the time on these podcasts I listen to. These guys that are multimillionaires, they're still like. I would rather sometimes just be home with my family. You know, that's it's it's an interesting predicament too. The same thing. It's like it's a constant battle of wanting to be in the studio, being creative, or you know, yeah, enjoying the family time. Yeah, well, it's part of being an artist too. It's you know, having a, a home business. I think it's the same. It's mm-hmm. it's that you you could always be working. Yeah, and so so I I'm kind of constantly fighting guilt at all times because if I'm if I'm not working then I could be working and if I'm working then I could be hanging out with my daughter and if and, and if I'm asking my mom to babysit then I'm putting her out and you know it's like but she wants to do it you know but I sort of I it's I feel this constant struggle between maintaining maintaining all of that so you never quite feel comfortable you're always kind of stuck in the middle and I'm never ahead and there's always 20 ideas that are left behind mm-hmm. and, you know 
And then I um, just want to make orchid for a month. <laughs> or something like, 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 yeah, I, I'm very much that way. I have a really hard time, like, you know, I couldn't ever make 50 of something, you know, even like, like, and maintaining a schedule. It's like, it's, it's kind of either working or it's not. Yeah. You know, it, it's hard to make something if you don't want to make it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. I've, I've I've gotten custom orders before where I was like, man, I should not have taken that order because I do not want to make that, or I'm, or I got it and then like I get yeah. go to make it and I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling it, you know, type of thing. Yeah, yeah. custom orders are real. I've gotten really good at saying no over the years because it is not easy to to make everybody happy in yeah. those situations. I have to be really sure that that person understands that the glass never does what I think it's going to do. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't what do what you think I'm going to do with it. <laughs> you know? Yep, it's got to go and, along and the And it's something that I, I can sell, you know, afterwards that I'm confident that I can sell no matter what, you know, so so that way everybody's happy because you, know, you don't want to buy something that you don't like either. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's tricky. Yeah, yeah, it sure is, man. It's yeah, it's all very tricky. That's why I was kind of glad to move out of my garage and get out and actually into a studio space because, like, I was the same way. Like, I get up in the morning and do yard work or play with my animals or my wife or kids or whatever, and I'm like, damn, I could be out there working working on this so-and-so's order and, instead of being out here, but then I knew I could do it at night instead, but then I go do it yeah. at night, and I'm a little more tired because I was playing all day. Or, you know, it's yep. like, you know, it's... Yep. <laughs> it sucks. Yep, I, I, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm yeah. definitely not there's no, there's no winning. But it's just trying to like uh, you know trying to not get yourself up about it. I think is the most important part. You know, trying to to actually not feel all that guilt. You know, because because it's just there. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. not doing you any good. So and and it's just life. It's all good. Yeah. Everything's kind of gray, and there's there's a there's no one right way to do anything. Just like glass. You know, there's a million ways to go at everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that whole makes us human element too. You know, it's like if we're not experiencing this emotion, then maybe we shouldn't be doing it because we should be experiencing this emotion. It makes us makes us feel you know humble and human and human at the same time. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and being humble, I think, is a good thing, especially in the glass world. Yeah, you use a touch more of it in some cases. You know, but it's tough when everybody's you know loving you. Yeah, no, stay humble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've always been told I'm a little bit too humble sometimes with certain things. I'm like, oh, I didn't know there's such a thing, but like, I'm not a pushover, so I don't know. We'll we'll see. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Well, I don't think that's a bad. I don't think that's a bad quality. Not in my book. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Hell yeah, dude. Well, uh, I guess to kind of move forward uh, before we kind of do that, I'm going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors, and we will be right back. Uh, all right, we're back. So, uh, cool. yeah, dude, I can sit and talk to you all night, brother, but it's, I am fucking exhausted. So, uh, right on. yeah, definitely. Just being almost midnight. So, yeah, dude, so let's, uh, jump into this lightning <laughs> round here. But I, I, I definitely want to, uh, do a little follow up too with you after, uh, your class that you do. So I'm really curious to, mm-hmm. like, 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 talk, like, talk about that process of being, a, like, of teaching a class. Um, because I know a lot of people out there are interested in getting out and doing demos and teaching and whatever. So I think it'd be kind of fun to, to discuss the process of how you went about setting it up or if they contact, you know, like go through the whole story of like how that came to be, how you came to be, a, you know, asked to be a teacher at this specific thing. If you're up for it, you know, mm-hmm. I think it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, sure. I mean, I talked about it a little bit kind of in that, you know, it was really mm-hmm. yeah, Wes asking me to do it. You know, and I was like, I kind of did that thinking that I, with, I'm going to go learn how to take it. That's why I'm taking a class on how to teach a class. Right, right. Kind of thing. Because he's done it before. I'd like to go see how he did it. Yeah. Kind of thing. yeah. But yeah, definitely. I mean, it, like I said, it is going to be my first real class. So. Yeah, that's why I think so I, we'll I'd like see. to do it. Yeah, because like, even if it's a horror story, let's like let's fucking talk about it, you know. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so far, there's only, you know, only three people signed up for it. But I think, you know, most most of the time, this time of year, especially, I'd imagine it's probably going to be last minute. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah, dude. And I don't, quite frankly, and I can have up to 12 people. I don't, you know, 12 people might be a little bit overwhelming, so. Yeah, that sounds yeah. crazy. I could do like six. That's like my max on my classes was six. Yeah. That was all I could handle. Really? Yeah. Yeah, we had, 
We had eight at Penland. Well, you have an assistant, and, though, which helps. That's, I was always on my own. Ah. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, Nathan will be there helping me, so. Yeah, makes a big difference. Nice. All right, man. Well, uh, right on. Yeah, let's get into our favorite part of the show. It's the, the lightning round, and I'm still working on another name for this cliche lightning round term, so I don't know. I'm just going to light the torch or start the killing up or begin the annealing process or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out down the road, but for now, we're going to call it right the lightning round. So. And in the lightning round, it consists of a uh, half dozen or so questions, and I just need a 30 to 6 second answer, and you can expound upon them if you'd like, as we always do, and uh, just kind of have fun with it, man. And, uh the first question is, if there is uh, any living glass artist that you have not worked with, who is it and why? You know, man, I've heard you say this question so many times and now that I'm put on the spot. <laughs> There's so many people right now, it's just kind of overwhelming to, like, see. You know, every, every day, like, mm-hmm. I feel like I find somebody new that I'm finally like, oh, they must be new. And it's like, they've got, like, 100,000 followers on Instagram or something. It's like... <laughs> You know, and I just can't believe it. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I'm always looking for people who I feel like, you know, like, you know, styles mesh together kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'd love to work with some, you know, of the, of the lady glass blowers. So it's just, um, uh, just looking at Delene Peralta's work. I'd love to look at her, you know, or, or lace face or, you know, uh, I, I feel like, the, you know, my stuff tends to be a little bit more feminine. So, so I don't know. They'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, I agree, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah! So, uh, what are your top five favorite colors in glass? I I'm staring at my all my glass colors right now. That's like you know, asking who's your your favorite child. <laughs> um, God, I don't know. You know, I mean, overall, the ones that I end up ordering, you know, more often than not, are probably like um, cobalt six. You know, or, or I used to use turbo, but like cobalt six. You know, just super dense cobalt blue is mm-hmm. so nice. And jet black, I use a ton of. And jackpot is probably one of my favorite colors right now, huh. um, just because I kind of mix my own custom sparkly rods with it. And I, I don't use it on its own all that much. I, I mix other colors together with it because nice. it's just such a nice dense sparkle. Um, let's see, that's three. Gosh, I don't know. I, I love like a chartreuse crayon. Actually, is another favorite for Leafs. Like that's always a nice color. And then I'm really enjoying the Illuminati just as like an overlay color for me. Even not using it for its UV qualities, it's like a popping yellow green that I can put over the top of yellow and protect the cadmium from boiling, and it doesn't you know dilute the color kind of thing. So okay. I'm having fun with that right now. But I use everything, everybody's colors. The only colors I don't tend to use are like um, amber purples and striking colors. I don't really have much use for for things that I don't know what I'm going to get, you know, if I keep reheating mm-hmm. them. Yeah, you're it's very specific. It's kind of antithetical to my style. Yeah, it makes sense. Absolutely. So, so I, I, and I love them. I just don't, just don't find myself using them all that much. But I love them all. <laughs> Oh, every yeah. company, everybody's. <laughs> Beautiful. So if you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, what is it? It's whatever the sound being kicked in the nuts sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> you because know, it, it really is that kind of like just horrible side ache, like, like wind knocked out of you kind of thing that's painful at the same time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know. know. That works for me, dude. So, uh, (laughs) what's what's the worst injury you've had in the glass studio? I stuck my hand in the torch twice Mm -hmm. over the years. And uh, those are probably the worst, but, um, you know, really not too bad. Just kind of quick little, little flip my hand over real fast into it. But probably the most fun one was when I, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly what I was doing, but just had, just had a, a rod that had a crack in it, pushing two things together or something, like a Maria kind of thing or something, I can't remember. And the rod broke off and I just shoved it right into my thumb. Mm. And I'm, I'm really bad with blood. Like my whole family has a bad history of blood. I think I 
I like turned the torch off, walked out into the the gallery. Uh, Nathan, my buddy, was working, and I like sat down in a chair next to him, threw up in the garbage can, and passed out <laughs> in front of him. And it really wasn't that bad of a guy, you know. It was it was kind of it was some you know jagged glass. And stuff. It wasn't super nice looking, but, but oh shit, yeah, yeah. So that was that was a fun one. <laughs> But nothing too bad. Oh, man. That's, really. like, that's awesome. Oh, shit. So are you a TV or a radio guy in the studio? I do it all. I'm, I'm out here so much, and I like media and stuff. So I've got Spotify. I've got my podcast. i got audio books. I've been doing Audible forever, so sorry I couldn't get your, give you a, hey, it's all good. a deal on there. And uh, um I I got it. I hooked up a PC out here, and I got a 37 inch like TV in front of the bench. You know that I actually use mostly for um, for putting pictures up and stuff when I'm trying to figure out sketches and things. But I'll turn on Netflix and things when it's when it's uh, it's only stuff that I've watched before. It's the only thing I can you know. It's basically I'm just listening to it. Yeah, so. same here, exactly. But but. I you know I get bored of I get bored of podcast I get bored of music I get bored of audio books it's like I gotta mix it up yeah but I do have a hard time just sitting in silence that's the one thing I can't do yeah man me too like I I do will sometimes like if something stops playing I just I'm in the middle my hands are full I can't do anything about it but yeah I'm the same way like I, I'm all about putting on like documentary series you know like ancient aliens or some shit and yeah like, you know two years worth of that stuff on or whatever you know it's fun. Yeah. Oh man. I got HBO now when it came out and I did like all the Vice episodes and like a week or something, just like all this documentary knowledge of all the horrible stuff going on in the world and it was like, Oh my god, what am I what do I do with yeah, this knowledge? Exactly. Like, it's kinda you you absorb a lot when you're sitting here. It's it's uh, kinda dangerous. Yeah, you gotta be careful then <laughs> binge watching documentaries. I, know, I tell my kids the same thing. They're both young. I'm like, you guys kind of stop watching some of this shit because it is complete horseshit what you're watching, and you're gonna believe half the things you see. Yeah, you know? yeah. There is a lot of uh, a lot of crap out there in the world. I'm a I'm a skeptical leaning mm. person. Yeah, it's entertaining, to, but horseshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try not to buy into too much stuff or jump on it too many bandwagons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, our last and final question for you is if you were stranded on an island, it could be any island, deserted, resort, whatever, Hawaii, obviously, and uh, got your glass studio and all you have is a kiln, uh, your oxygen, propane, and a torch, uh, what five tools would you bring? Uh, my mashers. Um, I, I squish glass a lot. I've got these like weird custom-made mashers. You can snap it up. Sweet. Um, yeah, I need those. Uh, yeah. I better bring my glasses. You're always saying that. So, yeah. better bring my glasses. And I use these little teeny tweezers. I've like posted them on Instagram a couple times. They're like 350. I think they're for picking up stamps. Is what they're specifically for. They sell them at Mountain Glass. These little teeny tweezers with little flat ends. Hmm. And I have like 10 of them sitting out on my bench. They're all kind of different shapes at the ends when you buy them. And I use those things for everything. So a pack of ten of those, oh, yeah. and I'm sure I could find something to squish glass on. I better make some glass. Yeah. I don't know. My whole color collection. <laughs> Can I, I do that? Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, all my current glass. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Well, it's been a pleasure, brother, as always. And uh, you know, if I wasn't so tired. Being, you know, again, those that don't realize we're him and I are six hours apart time zone wise, so it's uh, yeah, midnight here yeah, and six, six, six o'clock there, so yeah, it's all good though. Well worth staying up and getting this in here. Um, but yeah, man, yeah, anytime. So. I, I love talking glass, so I don't know. Either. Any, uh, you know, I love podcasts where it's just people hanging out, like a bunch of people get together every week and like talk about what whatever they're thinking about you know mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever want to do something like that but Dude, I'm all about it be fun too yeah fuck yeah yeah yeah, I'm actually uh, just kind cool. of a side note too I'm going to be uh, starting some mastermind groups here pretty soon and uh I'd love to have you on board dude like I've got three guys already lined up and I'm looking for one more person so I can uh I'll be in touch about that because it'd be fun to have you on and a part of that and basically it's going to be you know 
five guys talking about glass and business and life and how to better ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know. Cool. And they're all family. Right and they're all guys that have kids too, so it's a an important thing. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. So before we let you go, if you want to uh, give us any parting piece of advice to the newbies and the OGs out there, and then uh, also where we can find you in cyberspace. Uh, Just um, keep making more work. Enjoy it and have fun. And be a geek. Find something that you're a geek about, you know, and then you've got a subject to, to impart on your glass, you know, something to then take. If you're just a geek about the glass, that's cool too, but, you know, it helps to have something else to bring to that. So that's okay. a good one. Cool. And then um, I've got a website, uh, JupiterNielsenFlameworking.com. You can probably just ju- uh, Google Jupiter Glass Maui, you know, any of those things together, and it, it should come up And because um, everybody spells my last name wrong. And um, same thing on Instagram. It's just Jupiter Nielsen I'm on there. My last name is N-I-E-L-S-E-N literally spelled it wrong on my birth certificate and <laughs> the doctor corrected it you can see it but uh yeah that's kind of i i mainly you know I, I people can friend me on facebook but i'm not really i don't really have a page and i don't post there much i i really enjoy instagram just being photos and i love the feedback i get from people and stuff so search for me on instagram hell yeah and i'll have all Give this uh, all the links and info in the show notes as well for you guys so you, yeah it easier for you and then, then uh, the Bolero School is uh, my upcoming class, November seventh to ninth. Um, check out them. They got an Instagram and they got a good website. Sign up on there, and uh, they got Mark Lamy's coming next month. I wish I could go take that class. Hmm. Okay, sweet dude. Well, like, Fair enough. Yeah, man, it's been a lot of fun. And my, uh, I guess my next goal, really, before you leave there, if you ever decide to move back to the states, is for me to come visit before you do that. So. Yeah, anytime, anybody who comes out to Hawaii, please come, come say hi. I'm always bummed when I hear somebody came to the island and didn't say hi. You know, I just had some folks here the other day. I took my hike and did stuff. So, <laughs> just because they were on Instagram, said hi. Oh man, I'd, I'd love to come have you g- give me a fucking tour of the. Of the the nature there. Yeah. I actually enjoy being tour guide, so so give me a reason. Yeah, dude. I'm buying tickets right now. <laughs> Sweet. This is a pretty good cheap time of year.